So we're now a third of the way through every federal election in Australian history. We've come a long way since Edmund Barton's Protectionist Party defeated George Reid's Free Trade Party in the election of 1901. In the last 40 years, we've seen the rise of the Labour Party from a small bunch of union-backed parties to the first majority elected government. We then saw how infighting led to a Prime Minister switching parties while in office, and we also saw how the Great Depression led to some of the largest political swings in Australian history. Now, we begin the next part of the story as we cover the next 15 elections, from 1940 to 1975, where we will see one of the closest elections in the country's history, followed by one of the most lopsided. We will then follow the longest reign by a single Prime Minister and party, and finally finish off with the most controversial election in the entire nation's history. So let's get started with the second series of all Australian elections, with the election of 1940. As the 1930s came to a close, the world was becoming a very dark place. In Europe, powerful fascist dictators had come to power and began a path of conquest across the continent and beyond. In Asia, the mighty Japanese Empire's borders were ever moving closer to Australia's. Despite winning a third term as Prime Minister, Joseph Lyons was quickly finding himself way over his head in matters he was not qualified for. By 1938, Lyons had secretly began to plan out his retirement from federal politics, hoping to move back to his hometown of Davenport and leave the position of Prime Minister to someone much more capable of leading a nation into war. Tragically, however, his plans would not come to fruition. On Wednesday the 5th of April 1939, just four days before Easter, Lyons would suffer a major heart attack after picking up his son Kevin from a college in Sydney. He'd be rushed to the nearby St Vincent's Hospital in Darlinghurst, but would eventually fall into a coma and die on the 7th of April, Good Friday. One of Australia's most beloved Prime Ministers had just become the first to die while in office. While the nation grieved its loss of its leader, Lyons' United Australia Party was struggling with who should succeed him. There was no constitutional precedent on who should succeed a Prime Minister in the event of his death, and matters were made worse with the UAP's lack of a deputy leader. Eventually, Country Party leader L. Page would step up and take the role as Prime Minister until the UAP could select another leader. Thus, Page became the 11th Prime Minister of Australia and the first third party leader since the formation of the two party system back in 1909. Page's time as Prime Minister would be extremely short as on the 18th of April, a leadership ballot was held to determine the new leader of the United Australia Party. Candidates ranged from Treasurer Richard Casey to the now 76-year-old Billy Hughes. Even former Prime Minister Stanley Bruce was considered, and he wasn't even in Parliament anymore. At this rate, it wouldn't surprise me if Edmund Barton was considered had he not been dead for the past 19 years. But alas, at the end of the day, there was one man who people saw as a rightful successor to Joseph Lyons and that was former Victorian Deputy Premier Robert Gordon Menzies. Menzies was an exceptional politician who was very well acquainted with the law and the constitution, and had moved into federal politics to replace former Nationalist leader John Latham, who had moved to join the Supreme Court of Australia. His move to leader of the United Australia Party, however, did not go over well with current interim Prime Minister L. Page. Page openly accused Menzies of incompetence and cowardice, a move partly derived from Menzies' refusal to enlist during World War I. And upon Menzies assuming the role as Prime Minister on the 26th of April, Page would withdraw his party's support from the coalition. This move was temporary, however, as Page would soon be deposed as leader of the country party, and replaced with Archie Cameron, who looks like a 1930s punk star in this photo. Cameron would then see the country party reinstate their support for the coalition. Menzies' leadership would immediately be put to the test when on September the 3rd, less than five months after assuming office, Britain and France would declare war on Nazi Germany in response to their full invasion of Poland. On the very same day, Menzies would declare Australia would join Britain and France in declaring war on Germany in the following speech. Fellow Australians, it is my melancholy duty to inform you officially that in consequence of a persistence by Germany in her invasion of Poland, Great Britain has declared war upon her and that as a result, Australia is also at war. Menzies would then begin to rally Australians for war, but would face problems due to Australia's bitter memories of the First World War and his own lack of military service. He also had to deal with his previous support for the German appeasement policies of former British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain, which historians look back on as a terrible policy which allowed Germany to become a much more powerful threat to Western democracies. With the chaos of World War II unfolding, Menzies was in no mood to call an election, hoping to delay it, potentially until 1941. 
But another tragedy would hit the Federal Australian Parliament, when on the 13th of August, a Lockheed Hudson bomber carrying three of Menzies' cabinet ministers, including the Minister of Army and Repatriation, crashed on approach to Canberra, killing everyone on board. This event would not only seriously impact the Menzies government's ability to govern, it also brought about the situation in which three by-elections would be required to happen, just before a major election. Thus Menzies would bring the election date up to the 21st of September, so that no by-elections would be required. Now it's about time I talked about the opposition. After a somewhat weak turnout in the election of 1937, Labour had vastly improved their position in government. John Curtin was quickly becoming a popular leader in the Labour ranks and began taking talking points from current US President Franklin D. Roosevelt and began a campaign promising a new deal for Australians in which mass social reforms would be implemented for the benefit of the working and middle classes. However, things were not going to be a walk in the park for Labour. Despite reunifying back into the party in 1936, the Labour members of the former New South Wales Labour Party, led by Jack Lang, still had disputes with the main federal party. These grievances would flare up again in the lead up to the 1940 election, when an anti-war resolution was proposed by communist sympathisers in the Labour ranks. Despite being quite the radical, Lang was a fierce anti-communist and would encourage several members of the former New South Wales Labour Party to break away for a second time to run as the non-communist Labour Party. So it was going to be another election in which a split Labour Party would face the currently undefeated United Australia Party. And the winner was? Well, no one. Menzies' coalition had won 36 seats, with 49.7% of the two party preferred, leaving them short of a majority. While Curtin and Labour had won the two party preferred with 50.3%, they had only won 32 seats. The non-communist Labour party had won 4 seats with just over 5% of the first preferences, and since they would most definitely side with Labour, the two sides of Parliament were in a deadlock with 36 seats each. Eventually it came down to the Federal Parliament's two independent candidates, Arthur Coles and Alexander Wilson, decide with one of the two parties to form government. Wilson had frequently voted with Labour in legislation, but would end up siding with the coalition, possibly due to the current infighting in Labour, or perhaps he didn't want to see a switching government in the middle of a war. Either way, Coles would join Wilson in pledging their support for the coalition, allowing it to govern for a fourth term. However, the delicate balance of power would prove to be very problematic in the near future. Come back next time for the election of 1943.